This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, so um, so what do we what have we done so far? So last lecture we looked at what the conditions were to preserve supersymmetry. In particular, we looked at the lowest order in the string length expansion of, of the heterotic string. But the type of thing we were saying applies in general. And we looked at what are the conditions on a manifold, on a, on a solution, such that you preserve a certain amount of supersymmetry. And we saw that in general you get some very difficult to solve set of equations, but if you really specialize further, you get something that can be described as an algebraic variety. And I s said many times that's going to give us a lot of computational power. So basically last time we did no algebraic geometry. And that was because we hadn't finished our algebraic geometry lectures yet, right? So now we have, so we can start to, to think about using algebraic geometry to actually attack some of these problems and actually see some of this power I've been claiming coming out. So to do that, we've got two lectures left. So in the first lecture, we're going to talk today about vector bundles over our Calabi-Yau spaces. I introduced this, this set of Calabi-Yau called the complete intersections and products of projective spaces at the end of last time. We're going to start to look at bundles over those Calabi-Yau and actually compute things. And the goal of the lecture, I'm not going to try and prove every little formula I use. Right? There's, there's two reasons for this. One is I don't really have to because there were, our maths lecturer did such a fantastic job. He's proven a lot of the things that we actually need to use anyway. But the other thing is, is I don't really want to, to, to show you the details of how in this particular computation I go through and I end up with this integer as an answer. What I want to show you is give you an idea of how you put one of these calculations together. So any one of these little tools, so for example, we'll see a sequence called a junction. Any one of these little tools, you can look up very easily in a textbook and see what the proof is. What's difficult to know, and can be difficult even looking at papers where people are doing a calculation like this, is how these tools are put together to actually get an answer. And so that's the thing we're going to try and stress. So you may ask um, why on earth you care about looking at vector bundles and doing calculations with vector bundles over the Calabi-Yau uh, in, in these cases. And roughly speaking, there are two reasons. One is by looking at something called the tangent bundle, you can learn more about the Calabi-Yau itself and how that is involved in the dimensional reduction of your, your string theory or your higher dimensional theory. And the other reason is that very often you'll have gauge fields in your string theory setup. And those gauge fields are described as a connection on a vector bundle. And by studying the vector bundle itself, you can get very powerful tools for, for studying, essentially, gauge field VEVs in a solution. OK, so we're going to do this in this lecture. We're going to play around with these sort of abstract techniques in this lecture. And it always looks kind of surprising. So what we're going to do is basically something called sequence chasing. We're just going to watch numbers go through these exact sequences. And it always leaves me with a, a, a suspicious feeling when I see something like this. I mean, it's perfectly fine. But it, it, as a physicist, someone who's been trained in a certain way, you, you like to get more into the guts of it to see what's going on. So in the next lecture, what we'll finish up by doing is talking about basically computational techniques, things you can do on your PC to actually manipulate polynomials. Because after all, once we've turned the thing into a problem in algebraic geometry, all we're doing is playing with polynomial equations, basically. So in the third lecture, we'll go on to do something more concrete. We'll look at some of these polynomial methods, which I will. They're sufficiently simple that we will be able to do proofs. And then we'll use that to do one big example of something physical at the end. OK, so let's start um, lecture two, which is going to be vector bundles. So how do vector bundles come into our theory? Well, there's several different ways. Let's start with our usual case of the, the heterotic string, and then we'll talk about generalizations in a minute. So the action I gave you for the heterotic string last time was actually the lowest order in an expansion in the string length. And if you go to the next order, there is a kinetic term for some gauge fields. And those gauge fields, it's not so important, but they're either valued in an E8 times E8 gauge group, or they're valued in SO32. And you can ask, what do I want these gauge fields, what equations do I want these gauge fields to obey if I'm going to look for a solution of my theory? Now, um, we chose, how did we pick the solution for the metric and the dilaton and H? Well, we chose that solution to preserve a certain amount of supersymmetry. 
So if that's going to be your justification for choosing the solution for those fields, you better choose your gauge fields in such a way that they don't muck that up, that they also preserve the same supersymmetry. So let's look at how that, that goes. To see what supersymmetry um, a gauge field configuration will, will preserve, we do exactly the same thing as we did for all the other fields. What we did there is we looked at the variation of the fermionic partner of the field and asked that it gave zero for our four supercharges of Ln equals one theory. So what heterotic theory actually is, is it's a, um, essentially a coupling of, of super yang mills theory in 10 dimensions with one of these gauge groups to this gravity sector. So as well as our, our gauge fields, we have these fermionic gauginos, adjoint valued gauginos, <coughs> fermions, <coughs> and they have a variation. And it looks like this. I forget what I used as my index structure. Anyway, these are 10 dimensional indices. And, um, and in general, this is the, under one of our 16 component spinner transformations. This is how these things transform. Now, if we want this to preserve the same supersymmetry as our Calabi L manifold, then what we need is that this variation is going to be uh, acting on the preserved spinner from by the, man the manifold that's the spinner that is preserved by the manifold is going to give zero. Okay. Um, and just like we did with um, the H field and the derivative of the dilaton, we're going to take all the legs on the gauge field and its field strength to lie in the extra dimensions in the Calabi L. And that's just because if it had a, 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 an index lying in four-dimensional space, we'd break our assumption of maximal symmetry in 4D, right? It'd define a direction. So what we need is a gauge field configuration that's purely on the Calabi L that satisfies this equation. OK, so you can manipulate this a bit. Um, so let's do that. So the Calabi L metric, it's a Kähler metric. So in particular, it's inverse... Um, Its inverse has vanishing naught two and two naught piece. Okay. And that means that if you looked at the usual algebra of gamma matrices, right? normally the com anti commutator of gamma matrices is, is the metric, basically. So what this is telling you is that you can write this as zero, because that's zero. You can write this as zero. And the remaining commutator, which is the one with one barred and one unbarred index, probably two here, yeah, is two GAB bar, whatever that is. Okay, why is this a useful way, a useful way to write your gamma matrices? Well, up to normalization, this is a set of creation and annihilation operators. Now, it turns out that if you look at, um, say, the spin connection on, on the Calabi L that's preserving this, this covariantly constant spinner, you can work out um, what eta naught is in terms of sort of the Fock basis that's being given to us by these creation and annihilation operators. And what it turns out is that eta naught is the completely empty state, or the completely full, depending on whether you're talking about it or its conjugate. Completely empty state. So by that I mean that if I take, I don't know which way around I did it. Yeah, so if I take the barred things to be my raising operators and the unbarred to be my lowering, what this means is that this is true. Okay. So all we're going to do is we're going to write this out longhand and use some of this. Let, let's do that. So if we write that out longhand, we have, well, first of all, there's a piece with two barred indices. So we have F A bar B bar contracted with gamma A bar B bar. Then we have the thing with two unbarred indices. Then we have gamma A B bar. We have a piece where you have one barred and one unbarred index here. On all of that, we want acting on our eta naught, our completely empty state, to give zero. 
So some of this is easy. Um, this is two annihilation operators acting on the empty state, so that gives zero. And what, we have le what do we have left? Well, we have here, we have two creation operators, so this is like a two-particle state acting on the empty state. Okay. And here we have one creation and one annihilation. So that's either nothing or a no-particle state. So what that means is these two terms have to be separately zero. So what we have is we have f a bar b bar equals zero. That's one equation. Of course, we also have to have the conjugate of that. We've got a real gauge field. Um, so that's also true. And then all we're left with is this final term here. Okay. So what does this give us? Well, if you just write it out, what you have here is f a b bar, gamma a gamma b bar minus gamma e bar gamma a acting on our completely empty state. This has to be zero. Annihilation operator on the right here, so this gives zero. Here we have a creation operator and an annihilation operator. I can just use this thing to commute them, up to a sign, anti-commute them. I'll pick up a GAB bar, and this will allow me to put the annihilation operator on the right. So this then implies, just leaves me with the GAB bar piece, this then implies that GAB bar a b bar equals zero. And these are an were a set of equations that were mentioned at the end of the previous lecture. So this, so these are the equations that for supersymmetry our gauge field has to, to satisfy. And essentially the same equations would be true in the SU3 structure case. I mean it would be almost complex structure but and what these equations are called are the hermitian yang mills equations. At zero slope. OK. So this is sort of the gauge field equivalent, if you like, of looking at your killing spinner equations and finding out you need a manifold of SU3 holonomy. Right? This is some differential relation. And the claim is, is that you get some computational power excuse me, um, by turning this into something algebraic instead. Yeah. No, I mean slope. So the, this was the concept that was introduced in the last lecture. Um, I'm going to say more about it in a second, so let me go on for about a minute and then I'll, I'll come back to your question. Um, so what we want to do is turn these expressions into an algebraic um, discussion. So the first two are relatively easy. So remember, our gauge field is a connection on a vector bundle, so we're going to turn these differential equations into a statement, or these yeah, differential equations, to a statement about vector bundles. So these two are equivalent. A vector bundle emits a connection that is like this if that vector bundle is holomorphic. If it's transition functions, so V, the vector bundle is holomorphic. If it's transition functions, are holomorphic. Every vector bundle I'll show you today is holomorphic, so we don't need to worry about that. The other piece, as was mentioned in the last lecture, is tougher by a considerable margin. What is this in one-to-one -one correspondence to? Well, the correct statement is that this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with slope polystable. We're already holomorphic vector bundles. And as we saw in the last lecture, this is just some set of properties of your vector bundle that you can compute algebraically. The proof that these two things are the same is the donaldson ullenbeck yau theorem. So it's by Donaldson and separately Ullenbeck and Yau. Is there a question? Ullenbeck, Ullenbeck and Yau. And it's how we connect our gauge fields in, in, in one of these compactifications to something algebraic. So what is this slope polystability? Um, 
we're not going to go into too much details of this today, and that's essentially because slope stability of a bundle is by far and away the hardest thing you have to prove when you're doing a heterotic compactification. So the tools I will give you today would allow you to prove slope stability, and in fact, there is a nice reference um, which is going to take exactly the tools I'll give you and exactly the language I'll give you and go through and tell you an algorithm for proving stability. That's Lara Anderson's PhD thesis. Um, and it's ar on the archive 08083621. But basically the idea, is, as we saw at the end of the last lecture, is there's a quantity called slope, which you can compute from the first Chern class of um, a bundle or a sheaf. And something stable, if, as we saw in the last lecture, if any subsheaf in the bundle, anything that you can inject into the bundle, has a slope less than the bundle itself. And what the polystable bit is about is just that these equations are linear, right, in F. So if you have, like, one solution, and then you have another solution that commutes in the gauge group, so you avoid non-abelian nastiness, then you can just add them together, and this is basically what the poly is about. But there's just, the thing I want you to take away is there's just some algebraic way of checking whether you solved these equations, whether there was a connection on your vector bundle that solved these equations. Just like in the Calabi-Yau case, if you had one of these Calabi-Yau manifolds, there was a theorem from Yau that told you that you solved the equations of motion there. Okay, so I'll just write up one more reference, by the way, while we're, while we're here. So we saw, I mentioned this book by Hoops yesterday. There's also another book, which is not so well known, I think, which I really like for this kind of thing. There's a book by Schenk on computational algebraic geometry, which is not so good for stability, but for the tools we're going to look at today is very useful, and particularly for the second lecture. So I'll just put it up. So. Just another reference. Okay, so the idea is we're going to look at a calabi -Yau manifold. We will describe our gauge fields as a polystable holomorphic vector bundle over that, and then the deformations of this complete object describe basically the low-energy fields of the theory of the moduli. And this is an incredible thing. You, know, you saw this abstract definition of a moduli space by the mathematicians using this polystability quantity in the last lecture. And you know, as far as I can tell, these guys were just making up because it looks pretty that way, right? I mean, this is a nice way of defining a moduli space. But it turns out in physics that that's pretty much exactly the moduli space you'll see in your 4D theory. OK, so we have a polystable holomorphic vector bundle. What do we want to know about it for physics? One thing you might want to know is its spectrum. If I compactify my string theory, which is a bunch of gravitational fields and some gauge fields on a compact manifold, what matter what charged matter would I see and what gauge group would I see in four dimensions? Okay, so let's say our gauge fields are valued in SU4. Okay, so you just have some VEVs for some gauge fields in the hidden dimensions that are valued in SU4. What gauge group would we see? Well, we started with two copies of E8, say, in 10 dimensions, just a different gauge group. So let's just focus on one of them. So we start in 10 dimensions with an E8 gauge group. An E8 has a maximal subgroup, which is SO10 times SU4. So say we did this compactification. We integrated out um, the extra dimensions to get a 4D theory with these hidden SU4 value gauge fields in the extra dimensions. What would we see as the low energy gauge group? Well, it's just like the Higgs effect, but your Higgs field happens to be a gauge field in the hidden dimension. Right? Symmetries you preserve are those which um, your background solution is invariant under. So what will happen here is, is this SU4 will be broken by the existence of these gauge field VEVs. If you tried to do an SU4 transformation, they would change. But this entire SO10 commutes with those gauge field VEVs, and so that's the preserved low energy gauge group. So we get an SO10 gauge group in 4D. Just the Higgs effect, but with gauge fields instead of a scalar field. Okay. So that's the gauge group. If I put in an SU4-valued set of gauge fields, then I would get 
SO10. If you put in SU5, you'll get an SU5 gauge group. If you put SU3, you get E6. You can just work it out by what commutes with your VEBs. What matter would you get? Well, what matter do you start with, first of all, in 10 dimensions? So in 10 dimensions in this theory, all of the matter is just basically your gauge fields and the gauge genomes, and they're both adjoint fields. So all of your matter is in the adjoint of E8, which is the 248-dimensional representation. So now what we're asking, your first question is, what can we possibly get on dimensional reduction? Well, if all of your stuff transforms like this under E8, how does that transform under this maximal subgroup of the E8? And in particular, how does it transform under our SO10, our 4D gauge group? You can just work that out. Function rules. So you get adjoint of SO10. Good stuff, because we need some gauge fields. You get the adjoint of SU4. You get the 16 representation of SO10, which also transforms as a 4 as SU4. The 16 representation of SO10 is the grand unified family group of SO10. So this contains your quarks, your leptons, all that stuff. Um, you have a 10 representation with a 6. So the 10 is the, the bit that you get Higgs from in a grand unified theory in 10 dimensions. It contains a 5 and a 5 bar of SU5, and that's a Higgs triplet and a Higgs doublet each. And finally, you have 16 bar, 4 bar, and these are the anti-families. Right? If you have some of these, you'd have an anti-family. So what this group theory tells you is, hey, this is how it transforms in 10 dimensions, so this would be how it transforms under the four-dimensional gauge group. So the only possible matter I could get is things that are charged like this. Right? To work out what you actually get is a bit harder because you have to make sure what's the zero mode of the relevant operator. What is the massless Kaluza-Klein state of the gauge field? I mean, for example, is there a massless Kaluza-Klein state of your gauge field that gives you some of these 16 transformation type stuff? Um, and to see that, let's just look at uh, getting scalars, so matter scalars. So how do we do this? Well, scalars are bosons, so they've got to come from the only bosons we have around that are charged under the gauge group, which is the gauge field. So we look at what our gauge field looks like. So let's look at the barred component of the gauge field. What do we have? Well, first of all, we have this background SU4-valued VEV, which looks like that, whatever it is. We'll use algebraic geometry to describe it so we don't actually know what it is. In fact, we don't know the metric on the Calabial, so we don't even really know the equation for it, let alone what it is, but we know some properties of it. Okay. And then you can add extra stuff to that. You can just perturb it. So I could perturb it with a small change that looks like this. <coughs> for example. So, wh so what is this? Let's take this to be a gauge. This is a gauge generator got a gauge field. Let's take it to be one of these gauge generators. So it has a 16 index, that's that guy, and it has a 4 index of SU4, that's that guy. We have a 1 form, which is valued in the 4, and we have some coefficient, which I'm just going to take to be a function of 4D, or better yet, a constant. Right? So this is just some coefficient for this, this term. And it turns out that if omega i a bar is harmonic, um, delta c x is a modulus, so a massless field in four dimensions. And there are a variety of ways to see that, but perhaps the easiest thing to just say is just this. If, I, if that field is harmonic, then I can ask, if I do a perturbation like that, how does the field strength change? Because all of my equations, my hermitian yang mills equations, which I'm in the process of rubbing off the board, um, only depend on the field strength. Okay. So what does my field strength look like under a perturbation? Well, I have whatever I first thought of plus 2 times d of delta a. Right. That's the perturbation of the field strength. If this is a harmonic form, d of delta a is 0. Right. So the field strength hasn't changed. So it's still going to solve the equation if you perturb it like this. Right. So this is a massless mode. Okay. 
right. Okay, so how many of these masses modes do we have? How many of these matter fields do we have? Well, we have as many as different harmonic, harmonic forms of this type we can define. So number of 16s of is equal to the number of omega i's you can define. Right? So the number of gut families is given by the number of a set of harmonic forms. <laughs> and if you look, the cohomology group, just the cohomology groups have been being taught about this, cohomology group H1 of x comma v, so v here is our SU4 vector bundle on which our gauge field is a connection, this cohomology group, is in, its elements are in one-to-one -one correspondence with harmonic forms, so without omega, a bar i. Let me put the index up because it makes me happier. Okay, so, so roughly speaking, why is, is that? Um, well, I, yeah, please. Is there an easy um, commutator delta a delta a form? Yeah, 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 no, this is, this is a covariant derivative. With respect to the background connection, that's a really good question, sorry. So I'm just doing a perturbation here. So this D is the covariant D with respect to A background, right. this thing. But then why don't you get a commutator delta A with delta A? Um, because this is harmonic with respect to the covariant derivative, basically. So it's this, let me, let me say I'm going to take it to be this to be zero. And then this is harmonic forms that don't modify the field strength here are going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with this cohomology group. Well, because it's using the linearized, linearized. Yeah. All of this is linearized. That's why I've written delta there. Put that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So harmonic one forms one-to-one -one correspondence with this. Why is this? Well, this one here, you can think of as meaning it's one form. And V here just means it's valued in the gauge bundle, I. And you can see here that this is a four representation, which is, you know, we have this rank four SU4 bundle, um, and that's kind of what this means. So what's the upshot of all of this? The number of gut families in such a compactification is counted by a cohomology group, H1X of V. These are exactly the types of sheaf cohomology group we've been being told about. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to switch to algebraic geometry now after all this differential stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to construct ourselves some vector bundles. We're going to work out their cohomology, and we're going to calculate the number of gut families. And the thing I want to stress is not the proof of any one individual piece of this, but how you put the calculation together. So here's the basic plan. It's going to turn out to be very easy to describe line bundles on our space. Abelian gauge fields, rank one bundles. So what we're going to do is we're first going to look at how do we define line bundles. Once we've done that, we're going to make our non-abelian stuff, <coughs> our non-abelian bundles, out of line bundles. Once we've done that, we'll have, if we can understand line bundles, we'll be able to understand our non-abelian guys. And we're going to understand the line bundles themselves by using the fact that we have this description of our Calabi out as an embedding in something simpler. So we will work out what line bundle cohomology, for example, looks like on this simple ambient space. And then we will use that to restrict and work out what line bundle cohomology looks like on the Calabi L. Once we have line bundle cohomology on the Calabi L, then we can use that to work out what the cohomology of our bundles built out of line bundles looks like. You can see why it takes a lecture. Right. So let's just start with line bundles and build our way up. So So, not true in general, but on these spaces, so on our um, intersections in products of projective spaces, it turns out that line bundles are actually classified by the first churn class. So we saw in one of the, the previous lectures that, in fact, in general, that's not true. But if you remember the sequence, um, Ugo had, Ugo had it on either side of... Um, 
The thing that would make the first Chern class an isomorphism, there was uh, two cohomologies either side of it that needed to vanish. They vanish in this case. So line bundles for us are determined by C1 of L. Yeah. Sorry? Um, here they would be H1 of the trivial bundle and H2 of the trivial bundle, I think. And both of those are zero on a club, yeah. yeah. On simply connected. Well, if, for example, I had a non-simply connected canal BL, this would not be, uh, even if it was smooth, this would, one of these would not be zero because it would be describing Wilson lines, I think. So. But for us, they are, so I'm just going to stick to that. Okay. Okay. So the first curse, trone class, remember, is basically the trace of the cohomology of the field strength. Why does this help us? Well, this thing, because um, FAB was zero and FA bar B bar equals zero, F is a 1-1 one, one form. So this thing can be described as a harmonic 1-1 one, one form. But this is great because our particular construction of kalabi owls gave us real control over these types of forms. So the type of thing we had for our kalabi owl, we wrote matrices like this, just as an example. A certain surface in this ambient space and the thing that I wrote is that we were going to look at the favorable manifolds of this type. And what that meant is that the number of harmonic 1-1 one, one forms, that, or sorry, rather, to be more precise, the harmonic 1-1 one, one forms were basically the Kähler form of this P2 restricted to the Kalabial and the Kähler form of this P2 restricted to the Kalabial, and that's it. And that means we know a complete basis of harmonic 1-1 one, one forms on our manifold, which are just those that descend from the ambient space. In general, this is far from true. But on our case, for our manifold, this is true. Our types of manifold, of which there are about 3,500. So that means I can expand C1 in our favorable basis. So let's have a look at that. So I could just write C1L is equal to sum over the number of harmonic 1-1 one, one forms. Some integers, we saw that the Chern class is really this in, uh, element of a cohomology with a z in it, this integer value, times ji, our basis form. So j1, for example, here would be the Kähler form of the first p2, and j2 would be the Kähler form of the second t2, restricted to the club, yeah. Okay, so a, f uh, a line bundle is defined by its first Chern class, on these manifolds, a first churn class is just defined by giving a set of integers. So all we need to do to define the first churn class here is give a set of integers, and that's it. It is for P2. So, I mean, so it's the Kähler form of P2, or the Kähler form of the other P2. So it is, if you like, um, it's the thing that's related to a metric in the same way. It's not the Kähler form of the kalabi -Yau. That, that's something different. Yeah. Okay, so given this, a notation that you'll see all over the place in the literature, which no one ever really defines, is the following. I can take a line bundle, and I can define it by O of a set of integers. So one thing you might do on, for example, on this manifold, is you might write down the o line bundle O, two, three. Oh. What does this mean? This just means, is, means that this is the line bundle whose first Chern class is 2 times the Kähler form of the first P2 restricted to the club EL plus 3 times the Kähler form of the second P2 restricted to the club EL. So it's just a simple notation to use the fact that you can define things by the line bundles by integers. And of course, just to be awkward, people never write O of 0 because that's they just write the trivial bundle. So just a special piece of notation. Line bundles, okay? Pretty easy on these manifolds. Okay, how are we going to build more interesting vector bundles out of our line bundles? We're going to use these sequences that we saw introduced in our mathematics lectures. And there are many different ways of doing this, so I'm just going to give you an example. So let's just, first of all, 
recall what we were told, a, a short exact sequence is something that looks like this. So we have 0 goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to 0. For us, A, B, and C, all vector bundles. So these are all going to be vector bundles for us. These arrows, as we've seen, are, are maps between, let's call them F1, F2, F3, F4. These are, are maps, bundle homomorphisms between the vector bundles. And you can think of this for everything I'm going to talk about fiber-wise. So when I say exact, I mean exact on the fibers. So at every point over the manifold, each vector bundle gives me a fiber, a vector space. So what I can think this of this as is a, map, a mapping between those vector spaces for these different bundles. And the reason it's, there's some interesting things is these maps can change over the base. So the mappings between these different vector spaces between the fibers as I move around the manifold can change. And so there's some non-trivial information contained there. It's called short because it is. Uh, it's just got three terms in it. And it's called exact, remember, because, and this is going to be important for us, the definition of exact is that the image of Fi is equal to the kernel of Fi plus 1. So image of this map, kernel of this map. Image of this map is the kernel of this map, so on. And we're going to use two useful properties, which I'm not going to prove. One of them is obvious about these types of things, these sequences. One is that the rank of these vector bundles are related. So the rank is just the dimension of the fiber. And the rank of A is the rank of B minus the rank of C. If you think about it, as I just told you, in terms of these maps of the vector spaces, that's obvious. And also, the first churn classes of these things are also related. C1 of A is C1 of B, get it the right way around, minus C1 of C. Just some facts. So how do we do this? How do we use this, sorry, applications? We use it as follows. We're going to look at two types of vector bundles. We're going to look at monads and extensions. So one way is uh, you can build a vector bundle out of this, is, is the monads. So I'm not going to do the monad construction in its full generality. We're going to look at a, a rather special case. But I can form what's called a two-term monad on the quintic like this. I can define a bundle V by the following. I'm going to have a short exact sequence. And the first bundle in the short exact sequence is my V. It's my vector bundle that I want to define. I'm just going to give an example here. What am I going to put for the remaining two bundles in the sequence? Well, I want to build my vector bundle out of line bundles, so I'm just going to put line bundles. So let's have O1 to the 5. So what I mean here is I don't want to write O1 plus O1 plus O1. So I just mean five copies of the vector bundle. I should say which manifold I'm working on. So I'm going to do this example on the quintic. So we have one harmonic 1-1 one, one form. So O1 is the vector bundle whose first churn class is basically the Kähler form of the P4. And what this means is, is you take that bundle and you just have five copies. So if you look at the fiber over a given point, it's a five-dimensional thing, and it's just five copies of the fiber of O1. Or any other thing. So that's, we'll take a sum of vector bundles there, and we'll take a single vector bundle just for an example here, which has a different churn class. How does this define a vector bundle for us? Well, in fact, you can just think of, you, you don't really have to think about this even. You can just start to compute with this and use some rules and you get out some answers. But what you would like to have is an intuition for why this is telling you about a vector bundle. And this is the sort of fuzzy way in which I think about it. What this part of the sequence tells me is that V lives inside this sum of line bundles. That's the key thing, right? So the image of this map is just 0. So the kernel of this map by exactness is 0. So this is an injection of V into this guy. So if you think about it as fibers, this thing has a five-dimensional fiber over every point. And because of our rank condition, rank A is rank B minus rank C, the rank of V is 5 minus 1, is rank, is, so it's 4. So it has four-dimensional fibers. Okay. So V has these four-dimensional fibers. And at each point over the base, that four-dimensional fiber is living somewhere inside this five-dimensional one. 
So you're, you're embedding your fiber of your complicated vector bundle somewhere inside this, this simple vector bundle with a slightly bigger fiber structure. How is that embedded? Well, that's what this part of the sequence tells you. So V inside here is sort of the image of this map. Right? But the image of this map is the kernel of this map. So what you choose for this map here, between these two guys, determines how the fibers of V are embedded inside this direct sum of line bundles fibers. And as you move around the manifold, this map as a map between these vector spaces changes. And so how this, this four-dimensional fiber is embedded in the simple five-dimensional vector bundle changes as, uh, fibers, changes as you move around the manifold, and you get something non-trivial here. So that's the sort of waffly picture for what's going on. In terms of our properties, like these two, what do we know about this vector bundle? Well, we know it's rank four, as I said. And we also know another interesting thing because of the way I've chosen these integers. We know that C1 of V is C1 of this thing, so that's C1 of V, minus C1 of this thing, so that's But what these integers in here mean, remember, just from the stuff on the top board, is these integers are actually telling you what the Chern classes of these line bundles are. So O1 is the thing whose Chern class is just 1 times the Kähler form of this P4. So this is, and I've got five copies of it. So this is 5 times 1J. And O5 is, by definition, the thing whose Kähler form is 5J. And that means C1 of V is 0. So C1 is basically the trace of the field strength, roughly speaking. And the field strength here is traceless. Now, in general, V has a rank 4 fiber. Those fibers are complex vector spaces. So if I had a connection on that, something that relates these different vector spaces, in general, that would be some U4 guy, because it's rank 4. It would be some U4 gauge field connection. But the trace vanishes. So this actually gives this thing is actually an SU4 bundle. It's something that describes SU4-valued gauge field VEVs, and it is polystable and holomorphic. You can check that using Lara's thesis algorithm. I'll say more about polystability checks at the end if we have time. Stability doesn't really have so much here to do with the gauge group. Um, so you can take any type of bundle and ask whether or any so how do I know it's not an SU3 set? Oh, yeah. In, I mean, from the argument I've given you, in general, you don't. It's just that if you take... So you need a connection on... You'd, you'd have to look at more detail, so let me give you an example. So if I um, took this map, if I took instead... How am I going to say this? You have to look at how the connection is induced on, on this vector bundle, and it's not, not so clear. And if you take special maps here, then this gauge group will change. So, for example, if I took this map, let me get this right. So, you've got a map here that's mapping a five dimensional vector space to a one dimensional vector space. So, it's sort of like a five vector. And if I took one of these components to be zero, right, then one of these directions in the vector space would always be in the kernel. And this vector bundle would split up into two pieces, the piece where this kernel thing was non-trivial plus the extra piece. And then you would find, looking at that, you would see that the gauge group has disintegrated into S of U3 times U1, which is just um, SU3 times U1. So you're right. In general, I haven't, certainly haven't shown that the gauge group fills out everything that from the constraints we've got on the board it possibly could. And in general, in, you know, if you took special points, in general, it won't, but I'm just trying to motivate that if you took sort of the most general maps you could here, then you'll get... But you have to check, right? You have to check, but I'm not going to prove that today, so I'm just going to say if you take this map to be general, then this is an SU4 valued gauge field VEV, and this is my motivation, but you're right, you should check. And this becomes important, so in recent papers, we've been using this kind of thing to describe what happens as the vector bundle goes through these special points, because, of course, if the gauge field VEVs change, 
then the commutant of the gauge field verbs in E8 changes and you get different gauge groups in, in 4D. So it's a really good question, but let me just be fuzzy. Well, you have to check that this map exists and things like that. We're coming to that. No. So uh, there's lots of stuff that I, I'm brushing under the rug, basically, because we have to learn the technology I'm teaching now, and then you can check the stuff that you need to make sure this is actually a bundle. So it's kind of circular. But for example, you have to check that the HOM between this and this is non-zero, so you can actually define this map. That's an exercise in basically line bundle cohomology, and that's what we're about to talk about. So it's you also, if you want to do physics, have to check it's polystable. OK, basic idea, define a bundle via plugging it into a sequence. Just another quick example, you can do the same thing, plugging the vector bundle just in a different place. I'm not going to spend any time on this because we're not going to use examples. But for example, you can just have a single line bundle put V in the middle, and then have another single line bundle. You could do the same with sums of line bundles. This is an example of an extension. You're describing V in the same way. If you use our formulas for rank and first churn class, um, you'll find that the rank of V is 2. So this is, in general, because it's the yeah, connection is connecting complex vector spaces, it's some U2 thing. Um, the first churn class in this case is the first churn class of L1 plus the first churn class of L2. And so you could make similar argument. If L1 was, the first churn class of L1 is minus that of L2, again, the C1 would be zero. In general, it's not. And in general here, if the numbers here didn't add up to the number here, it also wouldn't be an SU bundle. Message is, take your line bundles, plug them into a sequence, put your vector bundle you want somewhere else. You can try and define a vector bundle that way. Why is this a useful way to define a vector bundle? Well, that's beca because of another piece of technology um, that we saw in our mathematics lectures. So what we saw was that if you have a short exact sequence, oops, then you can define, in, say in, in tubes or vector bundles, you can define a long exact sequence in cohomology. And it's cohomology that we want to work out, right? because that tells us about our harmonic forms. So we have a long exact sequence, which goes with our, our sequence. So this is the short exact sequence. And remember, we were shown that this, there's an associated long exact sequence in cohomology that looks like this. H0 A goes to H0 B, goes to H0 C. And then there's another map, and it keeps going, but I'm going to write this in rows because the board's only so long. So then there's another map that goes to H1A, H1B, and so on and so on, all the way up to HNC goes to zero, where HN is, or N is the dimension of, of the manifold, the complex dimension. Okay, so this is... You mean the dimension of the base? Yes. That's right. Whenever I say manifold, I mean base. You're right. The vector bundle itself is a manifold, of course. But yeah, good. So um, this is a long exact sequence because it's long and because it's exact, which just means that the kernel of one map is again the image of the the image of one map is again the kernel of the next image kernel image kernel. Okay. So this is great, right? In principle, this is fantastic because say I have this vector bundle. Right? What this does is it gives me a sequence that relates, say, the first cohomology of V, thing we want, thing that describes gut families, to cohomologies of line bundles. That's what, say, H0 of B and C are. So in principle, this is a piece of technology that for these bundle constructions allows us to take information about cohomology of line bundles and turn it into information about cohomology of these more interesting guys. So what's the plan? The plan is, we're going to first work out the cohomology of the line bundles, and then we're going to plug them into this kind of thing and work out the cohomology of our vector bundle. And I, I want to stress that you know I'm doing this for a certain calculation in heterotic, but this kind of technique can be used all over the place, right? You can 
look for the same features, which we'll mention as we go along, and try and use it in, in, in other applications as well. OK, so how are we going to describe the cohomology of line bundles? Lots of things. We're going to describe the cohomology of line bundles by using our simple ambient space. All our control is coming from the fact that we embedded the Calabio in something simpler. So first of all, we're going to write down the line bundle cohomology um, on the ambient space. And then, once we've done that, um, we're going to describe how you relate the line bundle cohomology on the ambient space to the line bundle cohomology on the, the Calabio. So this is the line bundle cohomology on Pn. I'm just going to state what the line bundle cohomology on Pn is. Um, you could derive this using, for example, check, which was mentioned in the, the earlier lectures. There's a derivation of it, which is basically check, in Hartshorn's book. So this is just some, something you can work out because your ambient space is so simple. If you were doing other constructions, you, you've got your own type of Calabial you want to work on. This is something to look for. Right? If I'm going to do this type of calculation, something I need is a good control of the um, line bundle cohomology on my simple space, whatever that is. So if I'm working on the toric varieties, right, the toric Calabials, my ambient space is a toric variety, and you better have a good control of the line bundle. And Torsten, for example, has written programs that do that for you. If you're working on elliptic vibration and you're relating things to a simple base, you'd better have a nice control of line bundle cohomology in the base and a way of relating that back up to the, the manifold. So this is the simple cohomology you need. And in our case, it looks like this. So if you have the line bundle OM on PN, where M is bigger than zero, and I'm going to take X to be the homogeneous coordinates on PN, then the only non-vanishing cohomology is H0, Pn. And if you use this kind of polynomial description that we saw in the previous lecture, so this is where you, know, you can define your bundle by first defining a sheaf and then showing it's a bundle. And you define the sheaf by giving the sections on each patch. You could give those terms of polynomials, all of this technique. So it gets defined in terms of polynomials. This cohomology is just the set, is the same as the set of the degree m polynomials in the homogeneous coordinates. So that's if m is positive here. If m is negative, so on Pn with m, less, uh, m greater than 0, so if you've got a minus sign here, um, you only have cohomology if all cohomologies vanish unless m is bigger than n plus 1. This sort of region where you don't have any cohomology at all is called the bot gap. And if this is true, then the only cohomology that exists is hn, where n is the dimension of the pn. And that thing is the degree... One way of thinking about it is the degree m minus m plus 1 polynomials in 1 over x. Now, this may not be why you're getting polynomials in 1 over the homogeneous coordinates. It may be far from clear. Um, this is one of those things I'm just going to ask you to take on faith in this lecture because it will take you too long. So this is something called the Bott-Borel-Vial formalism. And if you look up Bott-Borel-Vial in um, that book by Hupsch, he'll take you right through this, in, in fact, in some generalities. But just for now, believe me, I look trustworthy. It's, uh, th this is what the cohomology looks like. In particular, notice that um, if you have a zero here, so it's the <coughs> trivial bundle, so this should really be equal to naught, then that would be the degree naught polynomials in x, which is just the constants c. OK, that's line bundle cohomology on a single projective space, probably pretty much what we're going to use in this lecture. But in the next lecture, we'll use line bundle cohomology on products of projective spaces, what, which is what, in general, we're supposed to be working on. And um, what we need to do is take this information and relate it to cohomology of line bundles on products of projective spaces. And there's just something from called Q the Cuneth formula. Another thing I'm going to state, but try and motivate. 
um, which, which does this relationship for you. So it says that if you have a cohomology on, say, Pn1 times Pn2, now this has two Kähler forms, that of Pn1 and that of Pn2, or two 1, 1 forms, so I have to specify two integers to specify a line bundle. What's that cohomology? Well, basically, it's a sum over P1 and P2 such that P1 plus P2 equals M of your cohomology on the first space for the line bundle OM1 times your cohomology on the second space for the line bundle OM2. So this is just some formula. I'm just saying, seeing as I quoted the ambient space cohomology at you in the first place, I mean, this is just quoting what the ambient space cohomology is for the products. I mean, I hope if you think about this in terms of forms, this may look kind of reasonable. I mean, this would be an M form, and I'm saying I get it by wedging together a P1 form and a P2 form such that P1 plus P2 equals M. So that sounds reasonable. And, and, and this thing, if you think about this as having a U1 charge determined by M1 and M2, you get that by using things that have a U1 charge determined by M and a U1 charge determined by M2. So it doesn't look beyond the realms of possibility, but, but nevertheless. So on these spaces, you have a complete control of all line bundle cohomology on the ambient space. You know all of it. And that's why having this simple space is useful, because we're now going to use that to relate this ambient space cohomology back to the Calabi-L and get the cohomology of line bundles on the Calabi-L, on this polynomial living inside this ambient space. Mm. then all cohomology vanishes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So the only thing I've written up are the non-vanishing cohomologies. Everything I haven't written up vanishes. And you could check this by check. You could show that whatever space you got via check here was isomorphic to this 1 over x's, and you'd get the first space directly. Maybe. Okay, how are we going to relate the line bundle cohomology, so it's all about putting tools together. That's what I'm trying to get through today. So we've got the cohomology on the ambient space. How are we going to get that to the Calabi-L? Well, there's basically two tools. Well, one tool we're going to use, but we need something first, which is called the normal bundle. Again, this is another one of these little pieces of technology that, at least for hypersurfaces, is very easy to look up the proof. It's like half a page. But we're just going to state it and then say how it goes together with other things. So the normal bundle is a, an easy concept to understand. If I have my algebraic variety sitting in its ambient space, if you look at um, the tangent space to a point on the, the variety, it's a set of vectors. You're used to that being the tangent space. If you take that fiber, if you take the vector space to be a fiber every point, you get the tangent bundle, all the usual good stuff. There's also a normal vector. And you can make, if it's got more than one co-dimension, there can be several normal vectors. And you can make a, a bundle out of that in exactly the same way. And this is called the normal bundle, N. And there's an independent way of working out what this normal bundle is for an algebraic variety. And what is it for our case? Well, if you have this configuration matrix that defines our Calabi L, and it's got these integers in it that tell you about the polynomials. So there may be a12, a13, a11, a12, and so on, and a21, a22. So just a series of integers that tell you about the polynomial degrees of the equations that define your Calabi Yau. Then the normal bundle is just a sum of line bundles that's given by these columns. So in these cases, the normal bundle is. I always get this wrong, a i 1 plus a i 2 plus and so on. So if particularly if you have the quintic, as an example, you have this guy, his normal bundle is just 0, 05. Nice proof of that in Griffiths and Harris that doesn't really require 
any knowledge of algebraic geometry really too much. So here I just mean A1I is that one, that one, that one, that one. Because to define a line bundle, I need to define its first churn class. No, no, no. But which I do I pick? The vector of I, right? Yeah. So ah, okay. Yeah, so it's like that. That one is this vector of numbers. Oh, sorry, yeah. So to define a line bundle, I need to define a first churn class. So I need to give the coefficient of every element of my basis. I have one basis element of my 1, 1 forms coming from each Pn. And so I need to define the same number of integers to define my line bundle as I have Pn's. For the quintic, it's easy. There's just one. Um, you can tense the product line bundles, and you can take jewels of line bundles. And as we were told in the last lecture, and shown in the last lecture via looking at transition functions, if you take um, the jewel of a line bundle, in this, this sort of terminology, you just um, basically put in minus signs. So for example, if n is 0, 05, then n star is 0, minus 5. And if you tensor them, so if you tensor O m times O n, it's just O m plus n. And this was this argument that we saw in the last lecture with um, transition functions and so forth. OK, why do I want, the whole reason behind this was to, to have a bundle called n star, which is this, the co-normal bundle. It's the dual to the normal vector, uh, normal vector bundle. Why do I want that? Well, there's this tool for relating the ambient space cohomology to the cohomology on the Calabi Yau, which goes by the name of the causal sequence. And it looks like this. Again, another one of these things I'm just going to state, but it's pretty much the last one. So this is causal. So what it looks like is this. So I'm doing it here for co-dimension one. There's an extra complication if you do it in higher co-dimension. I'm just going to work for the case where we have one polynomial equation defining our calabi yau for example, like the quintic. So the causal sequence just tells you via the normal bundle, and after all, the normal bundle is telling you how your surface is embedded in your space. It tells you how, for any vector bundle, the, the vector bundle and the space are connected to the vector bundle restricted to the calabi yau So how do we use this? So for example, let's say we want to work out OX1 uh, on P45. So the hyperplane bundle on the quintic. So OX1 is, by the X, I just mean the line bundle on the calabi yau on the quintic. And this thing was the line bundle whose Kähler form is the, P the Kähler form of P4 restricted to the Calabi L. So in, this case, in these cases, this is the restriction of O1 on the ambient space to the Calabi L. So it's this thing. So what the causal sequence tells us is that this is a short exact sequence where these are bundles on the ambient space and this is a bundle on the calabi yau. So this is the type of technology you need, something that's going to link the two. And the normal bundle for the quintic is, uh, or the co-normal bundle is O minus 5. So this sequence actually says O minus 4 minus 5 plus 1 goes to O1, two line bundles on the ambient space, and then that's a short exact sequence if I then add in the thing I want to know about. That, so this is how you get one bundle on the calabi yau in terms of bundles on the ambient space. Why does that help us? Why does that help us? Well, because I can now go to the long exact sequence in cohomology associated to this guy and work out how the cohomology of the ambient space things are related to the cohomology actually of the bundle on the calabi yau. So if I write the long exact sequence 
out underneath the short exact sequence. So I want you to imagine I'm writing 0 goes to h naught, goes to h naught, goes to h naught, goes to h1, and so on. But I'm just not going to write out all the arrows. So I'm writing the sequence underneath the club yell. And I'm just going to write the dimension of the various terms in the sequence. Um, under the club yell, under the short exact sequence. And I'm just going to write out the dimension of the various groups using this information we had on the ambient space. We know what the cohomology of these are because our ambient space <coughs> is so simple. Right? So in particular, there was this bot gap where some of the cohomologies were zero that you were asking about. So if you look, this falls in the, the bot gap. So if you look back in your notes, all cohomologies of this line bundle vanish. So this is H0, H1, H2, H3. If you look back at your notes, you'll find that this only has an H0. So it's, it's H0 it is actually five-dimensional. There's five linear polynomials in the ambient space uh, homogeneous coordinates. And this is, remember, a long exact sequence between cohomology groups here. And these are the cohomology groups I want. So this is like H0 of OX1, H1, and so forth. So what does this tell us? Well, this cohomology is sandwiched between two noughts with a five. So what this says is that this exactness here tells you that this is an injective map of this five-dimensional space into here. And the zero here, if you chase through exactness means, means that this map is also surjective. In other words, if things are sandwiched between zeros like this, this is an isomorphism. So number, the, the number of zero, the dimension of the zero cohomology of OX1 is just five. Just by chasing through this causal sequence. And likewise, everything else is sandwiched between zeros, so the rest of the cohomology of this line bundle vanishes. Okay. So you get lots of details, there's lots of definitions coming on, but just keep your eye on what the overall um, the overall idea is. The overall idea is you have a simple space in which you describe your Calabi-Yau manifold. The space is sufficiently simple that you know all about line bundle cohomology on that space. Then you have a tool, in this case the causal sequence, that relates line bundle cohomology on that space to line bundle cohomology on the thing living inside the ambient space, the Calabi-Yau. So those are the two things you're going to need when you're doing your construction. Right? So you're going to need a simple space somewhere in your setup on which you know all the line bundle cohomology, and you're going to need a way of relating that space to your club, yeah, whether it's causal or something called Luray in other situations or whatever. So now we know all of the line bundle cohomology in principle by, by following this kind of argument through. I did it for O1, but I could do this for any line bundle. I know all of the line bundle cohomology on the club, yeah. And now I can go back to this short exact sequence that defined my bundle and we'll use the long exact sequence associated to that to work out the cohomology of the actual bundle, which is the zero modes of the dimensional reduction. Okay. So let's do an example, and let's do the example we had earlier. So a final example, we're going to work out, have I got till half past or? Yeah, roughly. So I'm going to work out um, the number of gut families of the following. Naught goes to V. This is the bundle we had before, our SU4 bundle. And all of this is on the Kalar BL. So I'm defining a bundle on the Kalar BL. Okay. So this has this short exact sequence, again has this tool, this long exact sequence in cohomology associated to it. So I can write the long exact sequence in cohomology underneath. So 0 goes to H0 of this bundle, H0, H0, H1, and so on. And I can use my results. So I just found, for example, that the cohomology of OX1, this guy, is five-dimensional. And it's only H0, all of the others vanish. There's five copies here, so what I have is a 25-dimensional H0 for 
for this guy, and then a bunch of noughts. I can perform, I'm going to skip it, but I can perform exactly the same analysis here for O5. Put in O5 instead of O1. You know the ambient line bundle cohomologies. Work out what the cohomology of O5 is. And you'll find that that is 125. And then all of the other cohomologies again vanish. So what are the cohomologies of V, our vector bundle that actually describes our gauge field? Well, we can just read them off from this sequence. If you look at this map, this is the slightly dissatisfying thing in this. This is often the way. This is called sequence chasing, all of this stuff. And basically, the type of method I'm using at the moment relies on there being enough zeros in the sequence that you can say that one thing is equal to something else. Almost always that goes wrong. Almost always you actually need to work out these maps. And in some sense, that's what we're going to do in the next lecture. But if you look at these polynomial spaces, these cohomologies are just polynomial spaces related to these polynomial spaces on the ambient space. If you look at a generic map here, so if this map's generic, it will induce a generic map here, you'll find that this map is injective, actually a necessary condition for this bundle to be polystable. And because it's injective, this is a zero. Once I've done that, I can just chase through the zeros, and I can see that I have a 25-dimensional space injecting into a 125-dimensional space. The image of that map is the kernel of the map into H1 of V. Why have I written zeros all the way down? So injective just says zero there. Um, the kernel, uh, the image of this map is the kernel of the next map. So it's got a 25-dimensional kernel. So this space, H1 of V, is 100-dimensional. So on this man for this bundle, on the quintic, there are precisely 100 independent harmonic bundle-valued one-forms. In other words, if you've dimensionally reduced the heterotic string on this bundle, on this Calabial, you would get 100 gut jack families. I never said it was phenomenologically viable. It's just that's what you get. But let's just think about what we managed to compute there. This is this amazing thing. I'm really going to have to speed up a bit. What we've just managed to do is take a manifold on which we don't even know the metric that we want to use. And we've calculated how many harmonic bundle-valued one-forms for a bundle where we don't know the connection exist on that manifold. You don't want to try and do this with differential geometry, right? This, this would be hard. And yet, what have I done? I've said 25, 125 minus 25 is 100. That's a pretty easy calculation. So this is why we put up with this specialization, right? We put up with this spe specialization from, say, a more general space of SU3 structure where we allow random values for various fluxes because this is an interesting part of the string landscape where we can calculate a vast amount. How about the space itself? So that's something we can do with gauge fields. How do we calculate things about the Calabi out itself? So I'll just do this and then we'll call it a day. You have to work that out. We'll do that next time. Okay. Yeah. We're actually going to look at polynomial maps on the computer next time and work out it's injective. It's not obvious from what I've said. If it wasn't injective, H0 of V would be 0. <coughs> so I know you know some of this, so I'm going to just give a technical answer. So, so then you'd know that the trivial bundle injected into V and it would destabilize the bundle everywhere in the code cone. But well, then that's automatic because of the 0. zero. Yeah, that's automatic. So all I had to use there was that it was injective. It's precisely working out when maps are injective or not, in some sense, in a more physical way of doing it, that we're going to see next time. And we're actually going to run code on the computer. So you get to laugh when my computer crashes and stuff. OK. So just quickly, let me talk about how you use this technology to describe the actual Calabi-Yau. You have to do the same thing. To describe the Calabi-Yau, we need to know about the tangent bundle to the Calabi-Yau. How are we going to do that? We work out the tangent bundle to our simple ambient space. And then we relate that to the tangent bundle on our club Yau. You do the stuff on the ambient space first, and then you bring it back to the manifold you're actually interested in. And again, in Hartshorn, the, you can work out, um, or he will give you the tangent bundle to our particular um, ambient space. Um, you know, this, this formula will change depending on what manifold you're looking at, or what type of construction you're looking at. 
But for us, for a product of uh, Pn's, so if we have an ambient space which is Pn1 times Pn2 times Pn3, and so on, then there's a short exact sequence, as always, that describes the ambient space, the tangent bundle ambient, the ambient space tangent bundle. It's the trivial bundle to the number of p's. Then each of these p's come with a Kähler form. So I have to define n integers to give a line bundle. So then you use these line bundles, one with a bunch of zeros to the power of n1 plus 1. M1 plus 2, and so on. And this goes to ta goes to 0. This is the ambient space tangent bundle. You can think of this as basically, these are the homogeneous coordinates, roughly speaking, and this is removing the overall scaling. But essentially, there's just some formula called the Euler sequence, basically, for the tangent bundle. So there is a formula for the tangent bundle on our, on our ambient space because it is so simple. How do we relate the ambient space tangent bundle the tangent bundle on the Kalar Biao. You're quite right. I mean, N2, thank you. And then N3, N4. Thank you very much. <laughs> Going too fast. It's always plus one. It's basically the number of homogeneous coordinates of that PN. Right? Sorry, thank you for that. There's some formula. Sometime I'll get it right. So there's, how do we relate this to the tangent bundle on the Kalar Biao? Well, there's a short exact sequence. This short exact sequence says that this is true. So it's a short exact sequence on the Kalar Biao. And, and its meaning is very clear. Imagine this fiber wise, and we think about what this means. What this means fiber wise is that the tangent bundle of the ambient space restricted to the Kalar Biao has two types of vector in it. It has a vector that's tangent to the Kalar Biao and a vector that's normal to the Kalar Biao. This is the normal bundle. It's in the sequence rather than the direct sum because as you move around the Kalar Biao, these things get mixed up in weird ways. But nevertheless, there's a short exact sequence that defines the tangent bundle of the Kalar Biao in terms of the tangent bundle of the um, ambient space. And so we can do exactly the same thing. We've defined the tangent bundle of the ambient space in terms of line bundles. We know line bundle cohomology. So we know the cohomology of this. We've defined the tangent bundle to the Kalabiao in terms of this, whose cohomology we know, and the normal bundle, which is the sum of line bundles. So again, you just relate it all back, and, and you, you get your answer. So quick calculations you can do to prove the power of this. Let's take the quintic again and look at its tangent bundle. Okay, so look at the quintic. The ambient space for the P4, the, the, the ambient space is P4, and this, this uh, tangent bundle to that is then given by the following. We've got 1 Pn. We have O1 to the 5 goes to this tangent bundle. Using Kozel, we can restrict that to the Kalar Biao. In fact, we've already done it. And then we have a junction, this guy. And the normal bundle for the quintic is just O5. So then we have 0 goes to Tx, goes to Ta of x goes to OX5. Okay, cool things we can do with this. Do you remember in the first lecture I said, hey, if you've got this surface, you can take the Fabini study metric, you can restrict it to the surface, you can work out the curvature, you can work out the curvature two form, you can take its cohomology class all with differential geometry and you should be able to show that C1 equals zero. Let's see if we can do that a bit faster. According to the, the, the rule we had up earlier, the alternating sum of the C1s of these short exact sequences is zero. That means that C1 of Tax 
is C1 of this minus C1 of this. What are these line bundles? Well, this one just means that it's, the O1 means that it's C1 is just one times the Kähler form of P4. So this is five copies of one times J. And this is O of zero. So it's C1 is zero times J. Okay. In other words, C1 of Tax is 5J. J is the Kähler form restricted to the club, yeah. Plug it in here, do the same thing. C1 of Tx is going to be C1 of Ta, restricted to x, minus C1 of O5. C1 of Tax, we just worked out, that's 5j. C1 of Ox5 is by definition 5 times the Kähler form. So C1 of Tx is 0. You see how quick this becomes. Right? You don't have to play differential geometry tricks. And you know, Admittedly, we've used lots of technology, and you have to go through the proofs of that once to know what this causal sequence was, why it works. But once you've done that, for any of these Calabiao, you can almost immediately check that it's Calabiao by working out C1, simply by sequence chasing, basically. I'm going to be cheeky and take five more minutes just to tell you one more thing now that we've got this all up on the board. Do you remember we looked at these harmonic perturbations of the gauge field? And the uh, harmonic perturbations of the gauge field corresponded to massless states, and they were described by a cohomology group. That's how we worked out the gut families. Well, the same thing can be done for the metric. Basically, and there's a lovely paper by Candelis and De La Rosa from the 1980s, which does this in physics language. So the point is, is if you have a perturbation to the metric, right, it corresponds to a, a massless mode in 4D. So the perturbation to the Calabi-Yau metric, if delta G is harmonic, so an, a zero eigenvalue of Lucianero that's operating. And there's two types of perturbation to the metric you can do. You can do delta G A B bar and perturb that component, type of component, or you can perturb that component, and of course it's conjugate. Okay. Imagine using the inverse metric to raise some indices here. So this thing would become G B bar A bar, because I'm raising a lowered unbarred index, it becomes a barred one upstairs. And this one would become delta G B bar A. So what you can think of this as a one form, it's got one down index, valued in the cotangent bundle. It's got one up index, harmonic one. This perturbation is a one form valued in the tangent bundle, right, because it's got one up index, which is in a sort of tangent vector direction. So these are called the complex structure moduli. And they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with elements then of H1 of Tx, true for any complex manifold. And these are called the Kähler moduli. And that's H1 Tx dual because it's a barred index upstairs. So we can take the quintic. We can take these type of equations that tell us what Tx is. We can sequence chase, and we can work out the massless modes in four dimensions coming from the me metric. Exactly the same technology. There's nothing new being used. Um, so if you do that, let's write out our cohomology grid again. Oops. First of all, you can look up line bundle cohomologies on the ambient space, cozel it down, get the line bundle cohomologies on the Kalar Biao, and you find the following. The trivial bundle has an H0 and an H3. O1 has 25 elements in H0 and nothing else. And that means that the cohomology of the ambient space tangent bundle in this case is 25 minus 1, which is 24. This is sandwiched between two zeros, so I get 0. Here I've got a 1 sandwiched between two zeros. So that's 1 and that's 0. 
put it into a junction, the other sequence that defines Tx in terms of Ta. Okay, what do we have? Well, we've got 24, 0, 1, 0 for the cohomologies 8, 0, 8, 1, H2, H3. N for the quintic is 05. If you do your causal stuff, work out 05 on the ambient space using the formula, restrict it using causal, you'll find that's got 125 elements. Uh, 0, 0, 0. You do the same unsatisfactory trick to work out that that is injective. In fact, there's even a differential geometry way of showing that because this is a tangent bundle. So this is zero. And away we go. This one is going to be 125 minus 24, 101. That's H1 of Tx. Then we have a one sandwich between two zeros. H2 of Tx equals one. And that's zero. So how many complex structure are there on the quintic Calabi-L manifold? Well, there's H1TX of them, because those are the harmonic perturbations of this form. And H1TX is 101. So the Kluntik qual has 101 complex structure moduli. So all I did was chase sequences. In fact, um, there's something called Sayre duality, which on a qual tells you that H2TX is H1TX dual, which is the number of Kähler moduli. So this sequence even tells you about the number of Kähler moduli too, and that's one in this case. But Interesting stuff. Um, I said the number of Kähler moduli, um, the, the number of harmonic 1 1 forms on the manifold, all of them descend from the ambient space. That's essentially what this says. It's just saying that the number of Kähler moduli, Kähler form, because they're expanded in the basis, there's only one of them and that comes from the ambient space. If you remember right back at the first lecture, I said you have this polynomial describing the Calabi-Yau. The coefficients in that polynomial are a redundant description of the complex structure. This is this. This is the complex structure. This is the sections of O5, which are quintic polynomials. So there's 125 possible quintic polynomials, 125 coefficients. And these are the redundancies being removed. So you really start to see the physics of what you saw elsewhere inside these sequences. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to introduce anything more. but. So here's what I wanted to get across with this lecture. There's an awful lot of technology that I've just written on the board that I've asked you to believe, things like causal sequences and this sort of stuff. But the thing I want you to take away from this is that there is a certain plan that you can follow if you want to do one of these calculations. There's other ways of doing it, but this is a very good starting point. Say you want to describe certain bundles over a calabi -L. Then you're going to need a simple space which is related to your calabi in some knowable way. Maybe your, your, your calabi is embedded in that space. You're going to need to know so much about that simple space that you know all of its line bundle cohomology, for example. You need something like the causal sequence that relates the two spaces, your simple space and the thing you're actually interested in. And then anything that you want to build out of line bundles, it's a good idea to build it using sequences because then you have these long exact cohomology things. And many of the papers that you'll see in the literature are exactly of this form, where people put together techniques of this type, and it varies in each case. You may be doing the torix, so your line bundle cohomology is different. You may be doing a, a fibration over some simple base, so instead of using the causal sequence, you're using a different way of relating your simple and your complicated spaces. But this is often the structure, the general structure, that one of these calculations have. And if you're having trouble following a seminar, for example, what I always do is I just try and focus on what, what was the simple space he was working on, and then see if I can get, take it from there. Okay, so sorry for running over. Are there any questions? Or are blue moving away? So next time we'll go much more concrete. We'll actually start proving some stuff.